Hello, this is Chronicle. I am Kedai Chiefan, and this is the exclusive. Um, today we are right at the University of the Gambia where we met. Uh, we are meeting Professor Dr. Siddharth Yafa, uh, who one time was a lecturer at the University of the Gambia School of Agriculture. Um, now, as far as his uh, current role is concerned, he is the acting director of West Africa Science Service Center on Climate Change and Land Use. You know, that is actually operating within the University of the Gambia campus. Doctor, welcome to the Chronicle. Thank you very much, Mr. K. Jeff. And today is the 2nd of November, 2019, yeah. for record purposes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, as you understand, agriculture is actually a major driver of growth in the Gambia. Uh, the sector accounts for approximately one quarter of the country's GDP, and it is also employing about 70% of the country's labor force. Um, do you really believe, uh, considering, in combination of the past and present governments, do, do you believe that uh, the agriculture, the issue of agriculture, has been a priority that it has deserved, actually? Uh, well, just to give you exact numbers, agriculture accounts for 30 to 33 percent of the government's GDP, which is less than a quarter, a quarter is 25 percent. Uh, in answering your question, there has been small strides in terms of improving agriculture production and productivity in the country from 2016 when we have the new government, as opposed to the former government. It was uh, a haphazard thing in the former government for 22 years. You know it, and so many people know it, uh, because there was no solid policy on agriculture, no what I call sensible direction toward agriculture. Uh, the government was not very supportive of agriculture, to be tell you the truth. Now, this one, current one here, the uh, transitional government, uh, has a national development plan where they have agriculture issues uh, brought up, but they still have to do a lot because um, we have not seen much in terms of production and productivity of, of agriculture since this new government came in in 2016. So we look forward to... Um, Great achievement for agriculture because it's the number one priority, economic priority of the country. Uh, it drives most of the <clears throat> economic activities of this country in terms of production, productive for food security, for economic growth, and also for export trade in the country. So whichever government comes in from now on uh, has to focus a lot, if not more, on agriculture than any other sector. That is because of the importance. Of yeah, the because of the sector. important, and also it is uh, it uh, addresses food security situation. Okay. Any nation that that is hungry is always poor. Will continue to be poor, and it will lead to chaos in the country. And no country wants to have chaos in the country. So the top priority that's going to mitigate that chaos is food security. Make sure that every individual, every Gambian citizen, has food, three square meals in a day lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Affordable and of quality. Yeah. So when you, when you said food security, my mind went back to the former government. Mm -hmm. We used to have, you know, in terms of lip service, it was very good at it, you right. know, that it prioritized agriculture. You know, it even put up a vision that says, you know, 2016. To 20, vision 2016, yeah. that is actually in place to, you know, ensure that Gambia actually sustain itself in terms of you know rice production or food self-sufficiency in general um, so but then we also have uh, this government coming in and then in their national development pl plan it prioritizes agriculture you know so i'm just you know trying to figure out wouldn't it, are you not seeing the same lip service continuing well not really in lip service now because if you compare the two in the first regime for 22 years, it's kind of a one-person control, one-person show on agriculture, almost all activities of agriculture. I remember there was uh, a national debate on this uh, food security at Karaba Beach Hotel. I was one of those uh, uh, participants, together with the former advisor of the former president on agriculture. The guy, I can't remember his name now, he's a Nigerian guy. So we had a very uh, tough debate on that one. My opinion was, at that time, was Government was just uh, talking too much. Government was seldom doing anything toward food self-sufficiency for Gambian citizens. Now you have this national uh, development uh, plan, the current government, that you have agriculture as one of the priority areas. 
But the way they are doing it's not as it should be. For example, how can you have the Gambian National Army in terms of getting into food production? They don't have the expertise in food production. I listened to one of their interviews, one of the senior army officers interviews, they said because they have the number, meaning you have a thousand men and women in uniform going to the rice field try to produce rice. Right. That's not the way. Number is not. It's the technology and the know-how to do it. You have this Jahal Pajar area, which, which I would call, consider, many people also consider in this country, as the breadbasket of the Gambia. Because, uh, but they are not given top priority to it. You go to Sapu Agricultural Research Station, which is to be very vibrant in the First yeah. Republic. Now you go there, it looks like a ghost town. It is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it's pathetic. The government should give priority to that one. Research is the key to agricultural production and productivity. So if you don't support the agricultural research, it's going to be very difficult for us to attain food self-sufficiency within a short period of time. Yeah. So you mentioned army coming in you know, yeah. uh, as a producer. And then we, we, we actually had some conversation with them and then they said they can actually do this. Um, the example they try to use is countries like Egypt, you know, that used uh, their army you know, to, to boost the productivity of agriculture. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you think this is a possibility in the Gambia? How, how do you object to it? How, how do you think this cannot work? Army's intervention cannot work. Army intervention alone cannot work, <clears throat> meaning to do all, everything by the army ain't going to work. Why? Because they don't have the requisite knowledge, they don't have the requisite uh, experience in agricultural production. How many of those army officers are agricultural experts, are agronomists or soil scientists? How many amongst the army, Gambia army now, who are agro agronomists who have a bachelor's degree, minimum degree, bachelor's degree in agriculture? How many of them? I don't know. And I think the best thing they could do, they have to liaise with the Minister of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture of the Gambia in order to make, make these things work. The Minister of Agriculture has the policy, has the political support. The Department of Agriculture has the technical support and technical know-how and experience. When you, when you fuse those three, Ministry of Agriculture, the Army, and also the Department of Agriculture, I think we'll be able to attain full self sufficiency But to say uh, the Army alone will be able to do it because they have numbers, no, ain't gonna, it's not going to work. And one would have thought that this is a very important decision government has taken. Right. And before taking such decision, you should consult the experts. Exactly. You know, you are one of those experts as far as agriculture is concerned in this country. Where are you consulted? No, I was not consulted. Was the university consulted? Not that I know of. And I'm a, a member of the senior management of the University of the Gambia. Even if the drafting of the National Development Plan, I didn't see any invitation. Maybe I'm wrong, but I didn't see any invitation to University of the Gambia management to contribute to the drafting of the National Development Plan, which is, uh, to me, is a mockery of the status of the University of the Gambia. Because we are the citadel of higher education in this country. We have the requisite uh, human resources to do research in agriculture, for example, in the School of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, to which I belong. And uh, we have the experts to give policy advice, policy direction to the government in terms of agriculture production. Let's talk about the productivity area now. Um, we have witnessed that, we have realized that, you know, in terms of gains, as far as, you know, production is concerned, it has gone record low, right. you know, compared to the previous, in fact, uh, when we say PPP regime, you know, I think agriculture was doing better. Yeah. You know, I could remember as a young kid and, you know, uh, coming from the agronomy area, Yali Pajar, Sapo area, Sharuya. Yeah, so what is responsible for this, um, low productivity? Yeah, you have several factors. One, lack of strong government policy, lack of strong government political support, lack of um, sense of direction from the government in, in order uh, on how best we could improve the situation. And also you have this climate change regime that we're in. <clears throat> You're talking about the First Republic. Uh, late President Gallo's time, we had enough rainfall. We had a lot of vegetation cover, vegetative cover in the country that produced a lot of rainfall. So we had a lot of uh, bumper harvest in many, many places of this country. Uh, but from the 1970s coming down, we have a change in the, in, in the weather pattern of this country. 
and uh, that created a lot of challenges. We have low rainfall or we have erratic rainfall. It will come short period of time, it will cut off within one month, two months, three months, it cut off. And uh, that uh, hampers the food production and also uh, the ability of the private sector to get in, involved in this country, which is very key. If you look at the agriculture sector of the United States of America, where I trained, uh, private sector plays an excellent role, a very essential role in agriculture production. You have the farmers with the backing of the banks, financial banks. You have the backing of the farmers by the, by the, central, by the United States government, the federal government. Even at the state levels, you have the backing of the farmers, meaning they give them subsidies, they give them so many in incentives, agricultural uh, uh, inputs and services are provided on time and uh, affordable for the farmers. So that motivates them to produce more. And private sector comes and buys their produce on time, a reasonable price, based on the market, uh, market price, international uh, market price, and the farmers have a better life. Fortunately, we don't have this in, in this country. Our private sector, generally, when you talk to them about agriculture, they say, oh, that's a long-term investment, it's very risky. What investment in life is not risky? Every investment in life is risky. But I think they should come and work with the government to make agriculture better, to make farmers more productive. Because farm, our farmers are very, very poor. They seldom have any support, both at the technical level and the financial level, uh, which will not be good if we, want to, if we want to continue on that trend. Okay, so you talked about sense of lack of sense of direction, and then, but this is a sector actually that doesn't, Gambia doesn't lack you know, um, technical department. Exactly. Gambia doesn't lack uh, experts. You know, in fact, the agriculture sector is the, I think is the leading degree holders in the country, mm -hmm. you know, including the PhDs. Exactly. But then one will wonder why this sector remains underperforming. Mm -hmm. And then at the detriment of farmers, mm -hmm. what, what is responsible? Okay, let me explain this. Some people, maybe they don't understand the difference between earning a degree in agriculture and also practicing agriculture. Those are two different things. You can earn a PhD in agriculture while you are not a practicing farmer. All you can do is just provide either policy direction or depending on your specialization in agriculture or you give technical advice on the farmers in the field on how they should do X, Y, and Z. Or also provide, uh, carry out research to provide that results to the farmers or to the extension agents who will then transfer the knowledge and technology to the uh, practicing farmers. You can have a thousand people, a thousand grammars with PhD in agriculture, okay, in different fields of agriculture, agronomy, soil science, horticulture, floriculture, you name it. But maybe all of them are not farmers, they don't practice the farmers. So that's the problem. People always misunderstand that if you have a PhD in agriculture, you'll be able to produce uh, make agriculture produce more. No, it's the farmers, the guys on the ground, practicing farmers who produce more with support, technical support from the people with uh, a degree. For example, I earn a PhD in agronomy. At the same time, I'm a practicing farmer. I'm self-sufficient. My family is self-sufficient in food. So that's different from X who earns a PhD in soil science, but he's not a practicing farmer. So he may not be self-sufficient in food and production because he doesn't uh, take part actively in production agriculture. So that's the difference. So I think um, to answer your question again, or to summarize uh, uh, my statement on this one, is that uh, earning a degree in agriculture does not necessarily mean that agriculture production should go up. They are not positively correlated, meaning if one increases, another one also increases. If we, um, if we have more people earning degrees in agriculture, therefore agricultural production should go up. Not necessarily. But how do you connect the, in terms of decentral? You talked about policy here, mm -hmm. and then you talk about decentralization policy, yeah. which is yeah. key. Yeah. And then you have all these experts. You know, they are all banked in one place yeah. in Congo. Yeah. yeah. And then this is, you know, these are people who are expected to rent down exactly. you know, advices on farmers. Mm -hmm. How do you connect that? Wouldn't that be their failure for the fact that they should be with the farmer, with the with the farmers, giving them right advices as experts? You know, with their degrees, but then, you know, gathering themselves in, 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 the, in, the, in the offices, in Combos. You know what's the problem with the Gambia as a whole? Enforcement of regulations. You're right. 
The government has me as an agricultural extension agent, for example. But I like to sit in my home in Sukuta. And I'm assigned on my letter of appointment, it says Girobakunda Agriculture Station. But I spend greater part, about 80% of my time in Combo. No enforcement on me. The policies that geared toward enforcing my presence in Girobakunda most of my time is not applied on me. Because if you say we are connected, oh, in Mumbai, this is my friend, this is my relative, it ain't going to work. I think that will stop in the Gambia very soon. Because uh, there has to be, yeah, it has to. It has to. If we want to survive, it has to. Because uh, I agree with you, I've seen a lot of my colleagues, excellent people, great ideas, great uh, knowledge in agriculture, but they seldom get to the farmers. You go to the extension service, how many of them see the farmers in a year, even within a small area of operation? Hardly any. And how do you see that? Is that fair to Gambia? It is not fair to the farmer. It's not fair to me, the taxpayer, because I pay taxes to government, and government uses that money, tax money, to pay their, their salaries. Maybe we need to cut off their salaries if they don't perform. There has to be a performance indicator. If you don't perform X number of uh, hours, then we'll, we'll cut you off, we'll fire you, meaning we terminate your service. It has to be a serious business, or else we, we will not get to where we want to get in terms of food self-sufficiency. So we have a lot of projects you know, that are related to agriculture. We talk about first step. You talk about they are, they are just plenty, you know. You are, you go to your provinces. You see a lot of signboards. Mm -hmm. These are all agricultural projects, yeah. different different ones. You know, tax to do certain different things. Um, one wonders, and this comes with huge amount of money. Yeah. At one point, I remember the former president actually you know suspended all workshops yeah. because he says all these projects are generated to you know gain yeah. for yeah. people. Yeah instead of you know, contributing to the development of agriculture. What is your assessment of, on these projects? These projects, they all go back to the non-enforcement of regulation on these project managers. Like I say, they buy many vehicles. They spend all, millions and millions of dollars on, on fuel and maintenance of those vehicles. Every week or every other week, see them from the headquarters in the Greater Banjo area, go up to Basse, come back. Even if those that go to Basse, you seldom see them going beyond Basse to Fastu, to, to Pasamasi, to Nyamanari, to Sandu. You don't see them. They just go there within one, one or two days, they are back again. You mean the trip, the trip, the trip, yeah. uh, the trips, the trips are not even realistic? Yeah, they are not realistic. They are not serving the, 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 the needs of the farmers, the farming community. That's why they have this project, because of the farmers, needs of the farmers. But they seldom serve the need. You go to the farm, you do a sample survey. Hmm? Find out from the farmers in the country, how many times in a year do they see a particular project staff come stay with them for max, minimum one week to give them ideas on how to improve their lives? You'll be surprised. They will rather, they will, uh, men they will say none. Was never. And they're true. I have seen them. I go around the country, almost all parts of the country. I see and I experience with the farmers, I talk to them, and I feel for them. But that change, the situation is going to change. No conditions permanent. It will change. Change is coming in the Gambia. I strongly believe that. I don't know when, but I can believe, I can, I can sense that it's going to be a very short period of time from now. There's going to be change, positive change. People have to buckle up. If you don't buckle up to produce, you're going to let go. Suppose you are the president uh, of the Gambia. I don't want to be hypothetical. Yes, I know. Suppose. So um, it happens that uh, you are the head and then you, um, some of these project managers, you know, who are implementing, who are generating this in, uh, huge amount of uh, multi-million dollars in the name of farmers, yet they are not putting in the right course. Yeah. What do you do? I am not uh, thinking that I would be a president. I'm not going through that uh, hypothetical situation. But what I would advise the current government or any other government that's coming is that any and all agricultural projects should be decentralized. Decentralized meaning you, can ha you have to have their headquarters in the, in, the, in, the, in the provinces. 
you have an agriculture project, for example, if it is a cotton project, cotton production project, you know, Upper River region has been the only cotton producing country, uh, region in this country during the First Republic. We have to have the project headquarters located in Basse, with all the operations in Basse in URR. If you want to introduce like a, a aquaculture, fish production, you can choose Mansakonko. Let the project headquarters be in Mansakonko. If you want to do uh, horticulture, North Bank region, Kerawan, the project headquarters located in Kerawan. No project, no agriculture project headquarters located in Greater Banyuria, period. That's where they should be, that's where they should serve the communities. I think that would be a first step in the right direction to make things work for Gambian farms. Okay. So what would be your also take on the issue of, um, you, you also have farmers who will actually cultivate and then make uh, good yield. At the end of the day, they will not have their produce you know, bought by the government. Right. In fact, they had to struggle, go into Senegal to, you know, at least find something, you know, uh, as a cover up. It's not even, you know, en enough for considering their, their, their output and input in that production. Um, what, what would you say about that? You know, in the beginning I said the private sector should come in a lot. Okay. So the private sector, this is a great opportunity for the private sector, agriculture. It should not be the responsibility of the government to buy produce from farmers. What government should do is enact policies, favorable policies, that will enhance agricultural production and productivity. Farmers get all technical support, inputs on time, and then they're trained on how to use those inputs in order to increase production. Then when it comes to marketing, that's where the private sector comes in. Banks could be involved in this to buy produce from the farmers and export them. Or private sector, other private sectors could come in, whether they are national ones or foreign, as long as they have met the government regulations in terms of marketing, they should come into the economy and take part in this business. It shouldn't be the business of government to, to buy produce from, from, from farmers, no. It's the private sector that should it come It requires in. their involvement. So? I mean, it requires private sector Oh, yeah, private sector involvement, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is another issue that uh, involves importation of rice to the country. This uh, requires a huge budget from the Gambia government. Um, and then we have some people who opine that it would have been better if such amount is actually given to farmers and then to boost their production you know, scale. If you, con if you look at Gambia's, Gambia agricultural setup, it is so much dependent on subsistence. So in terms of farm mechanization, you know, commercialization, don't you think uh, it's about time for government to consider putting you know, up a huge budget, you know, instead of uh, putting huge, uh, for, huge sum for importation of rice? Yeah, that's right. The way that we can cut rice importation is called, currently it's a, according to the statistics figures, 50-50, meaning 50% importation, 50% production locally. But I think we should go even close to 100% local production. That is possible. It is possible. We have the soil type, we have the, uh, we have the water capacity, we have River Gambia, surface water, we have underground, enough underground water in this country to produce rice. Now, what the government should do is to have, to bring in private sector again, support the private sector. Private sector will have contract with farmers. We call them contract farmers. You produce X amount of tons of rice this is the price you're going to get. You determine that even before production starts, there will be a source of motivation for the farmers. You will see a lot of people, a lot of farmers to produce. The government does not necessarily have to be the producer. Okay. All it needs to do to provide an enabling environment, political support, uh, favorable policies, and also support the private sector. The private sector has a contract with the, with the farmers. This is what happens in the, in the United States. You have contract farmers. Companies come in like Monsanto, Cargill, etc. These are big, giant agriculture companies in the United States. They come, they, for example, for corn, they will, they, they will contract with farmers. They produce X amount of tons of corn, of corn, 
then we'll pay this amount in dollars. We could do the same thing in the Gambia. If you do that, you will see the motivation of the farmers to produce more. Because the private company that was going to contract with them, the private com that co private com uh, company will provide all the uh, uh, materials, like fertilizer, insecticides, uh, plant equipment, seeds, etc., etc., to the farmers. The farmers will produce. You'll be surprised how much they will produce per year. It's simple. Now, somebody might say, a critical mind might say, well, you think it is simple, and I say, my friend, just do it. If you do it, it will work. If you don't do it, it will never work. You don't sit down in your office or in a comfort zone, and you tell me it ain't going to work. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried it? No. I have tried it on a very small scale. Every year, I choose a few farmers in my community, in uh, Sandy District, uh, URA, in Misra, and the surrounding areas. I tell them, you produce millet, a 50 kilogram bag, this is what I'm going to pay for it. Most of the time, above the market price, average market price. The produce, I buy. I make sure I keep my word, they also keep their word. It's simple. Gambia's cash crop is ground out. It has not been doing well of recent. Mm. Do you think, do you believe that it is time to look for or an alternative? No, we could continue uh, peanuts or granules as the cash crop. But we have to use new cultivars now, what we call varieties. Now the new scientific name is cultivars. We have to use uh, new cultivars that are high yielding and possibly tolerant to drought conditions. If we do that, we'll be able to make progress. Of course, it's very important also to diversify. We cannot put all our, all our what we call all our hopes in one one. There will one, be one diversification commodity. of cash crops? Yeah. Okay. You can have, in the First Republic, we have granules, we have cotton as the two major export crops. Cotton exported to France, granules exported to the United Kingdom. We could also add now, we can bring back cotton, because we used to have a generate in Basia where they pre-process the, the raw cotton before they, they ship it out to France. We could bring back that uh, agricultural commodity back into operation full time. And we can have sesame. We can have sesame. Some people can, some farmers can specialize in sesame production for cooking oil production. We can produce that locally, process here locally, and consume it here locally. And if we have extra, we can export it to West Africa. Okay. Doctor, finally, uh, we're running out of time. Um, mentioning the, all the challenges you've mentioned here, they are huge. What is the role of university? Because what I understand as a role of university is it should be an institute that should uh, conduct uh, extensive research, mm -hmm. you know, through which it will guide the government. But this is something we have not been seen from the side of the university, okay. as far as research base is concerned. Okay, maybe say you are, you are not aware of it. <clears throat> For example, in the climate change area, which impacts agriculture. The program that I'm uh, acting director of, this WASCAL program, uh, for the past, uh, since 2014, 2014 to 2018, we have trained two batches of master's degree each two years. And each of those batches, we've done, all of them have done research. They have published the, their research uh, work. And we have, from those published research work, we have extracted policy guidelines which we have submitted to our headquarters in Ghana. Then the headquarters in Ghana submits those to respective countries. For example, Gambia is a member of the WASCO. So that has submitted that to the Gambia government. And also, University of Gambia, we're doing, we're doing even currently, School of Agriculture and Environmental Science, we have collected data on uh, climate change impacts on crop production in Upper River region. Currently, we are processing the data we will publish it and we will develop a policy on that and submit it to the Minister of Agriculture. This is funded by United Nations Development Program. How do you prioritize technology into all this? Technology is... Uh, into Gambia's, in addressing Gambia's agricultural problem. It will help a lot. It will help a lot, technology, because uh, without technology, our production level would be challenged. And, uh, it is very important that we have technology. Just to give you another information, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, University of Gambia's role in, in, in research, 
currently the German government, the, minister, the German Ministry of Education Research called BMBF, has funded uh, two research feasibility studies that I'm coordinating, one on climate change and renewable energy, which, is, which could be used for agricultural production, and another one is climate change and land use. So by, by mid next year, 2020, we should pr uh, provide uh, a report on that one and submit to the Gambia government. From there, we'll develop a pilot project on it, those two separately, one on climate change and renewable energy and the other one on climate change and land use. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you for talking to us. Okay. Well. Uh, that's all we have time for. And then thank you till another time. This is the exclusive. I am Keba Jeffer.